Okay. Uh, hello. Uh, my name is uh, Bruce Slutsky. I'm one of the technical reference librarians in the Robert Van Houten Library. And this lecture is going to explain to you how to find information in physics and material science. Now, I highly, I'm glad that you have come to this lecture, but the most important thing for you to do is that afterwards, look at some of the resources that I've discussed here and practice with them yourself so you will become proficient in finding information. Okay, it's a process that takes time, uh, could take, you know, months, years to become really proficient in using the information resources in your field of expertise. So we talk about the scientific method. Uh, people in physics and other disciplines conduct pro, uh, experiments all the time. And uh, in order to do the experiments, they need to know the principles behind that. Same thing with information retrieval. We're, we're flooded with scientific and technical information, but you want to hone in on exactly what you need that you really don't want to get any extraneous information. You don't want to have to sift through thousands and thousands of documents and to find what you need. So you really need to find information at all levels from a multitude of resources available to you. So there's a parallel in, in, in how to conduct an experiment using the scientific method and finding information. So when you're doing an experiment and using the scientific method, you know your subject, you're looking for new knowledge, you propose an experiment to find new knowledge, the effect of A on, on B, and so on. You actually conduct the experiment. That experiment can take hours or days. And then you have to interpret the results of the experiment. And if necessary, revise that experiment and interpret the final outcome. OK, likewise with information retrieval, you know the scope and content of the databases in your field. In this case, it'll be physics or material science. You're looking for new information. You devise a search strategy using relevant terminology in the subject databases, which I'll discuss here in this lecture. Now, when you conduct a search, it takes seconds. It's not like an experiment, which could take hours or days. So after you get your answer set, you have to examine it and see if it's what you're looking for. And if necessary, revise that strategy based on the findings from the initial answer set and explore alternative options and examine the final answer set. And then you need to find the relevant documents and use the information that you find. Okay, so there are many sub-disciplines of physics, and you're probably more familiar with it than I am, is astrophysics, biophysics, solid state physics, general physics, and material science. And each of these sub-disciplines has its own literature, both books and journals. So we'll discuss various uh, formats of the scientific and technical literature that refer to physics, but they also refer to other disciplines. There's the journal, the conference proceeding, magazine, review journal, book, encyclopedia, and data compilation. Okay, so what is a journal? A journal is a publication that's issued periodically that reports original research. So original research is most important in a journal. Okay, I'm going to discuss in the next slide the whole process of peer review. So when you look for, in a journal article, uh, it's very detailed and they include the detailed experimental procedures. And it's aimed at very specialized audience of researchers in the field. So before an article is accepted in a journal, it has to undergo the rigorous peer review process. And let's discuss that. A scientist writes a paper and submits it to a journal. It can be somebody here at NGIT, another university, a government lab, 
or even a um, company. Now, as we'll see in a little while, journals are specific. So the scientist who's writing the paper has an idea of what journals he wants to send it to. Okay, each journal has an editor. So the editor may do a quick examination of the manuscript to see if it's in line with um, the topic of that journal. But he will send it to other specialists in a field for anonymous review of quality and originality. So the person who writes the paper does not know who reviews it. The people who review the paper don't know who writes it. Okay, so they check, was the work done properly? Is the discovery original? If it's not original research, it will not be accepted into a journal. Is the subject appropriate for this journal? Okay, and the most important thing is the whole concept of reproducibility. Will other scientists in that specialty be able to understand and repeat the experiments with the same results? Okay, now the editor uses the comments to either accept the manuscript as it is, reject it completely, or perhaps accept it conditionally and require revisions. Okay, let's take astrophysics for example. I have three examples here, astronomical journal, astrophysical journal, and solar physics. So let's take a quick look at solar physics. I'm going to click on the link here and of course in this day and age uh, almost all the journals that uh, university libraries get are in um, electronic format not like it was years ago where everything was in print so okay this is the latest articles in this journal called solar physics which is published by Springer okay so here's a here an article here Oscillations in the 45 to 5,000 megahertz radio spectrum of the April 18th, 2014 flare. Okay, so download PDF. So if you like this article, I'm just using an example, you can download the PDF. Okay, all right. So as you see here, the, any journal article will start out as an abstract. The title is just one sentence. The title might tell you only so much. It gives you the authors and then the author's affiliations. Okay, so this one paragraph abstract gives you more information to indicate to the reader what the article is about. Should the reader read on or is it just not of interest and in, in find something else? So let's take a look at the article just to see what a typical journal article is like. You see how detailed it is. There's an introduction with references, data and methods of analysis, the results. You see a graph here, more graphs. Okay, nice color graphs as well. So you see how detailed this article is. There's enough information in there if you needed to repeat the experiment. Okay. So expect all journal articles to be as detailed as this one is. Conclusions. Okay, and then a list of references. Okay, so that's an example of a typical journal article in this journal called Solar Physics. Okay, so let's get back to our PowerPoint here and move on. Okay, Biophysics. Okay, that's a different specialty. So here's an example of four journals in Biophysics. Biochemica et Biophysica Acta and so on. Okay. Solid state physics, IEEE Journal of Solid State Circuits, F uh, Physics of the Solid State are examples of journals in the discipline of solid state physics. 
general physics, there's applied physics letters. European Journal of Physics. That's a general physics journal. But if you looked at these journals, you'll see that the articles are very specific as to what they cover. Material Science, Computational Material Science, Journal of Material Science, with very specific articles within the discipline of material science. So what is a conference proceeding? A conference proceeding is a very important source of original research. Scientists and engineers of all disciplines go to conferences to report their research findings. So professional societies such as the American Physical Society and the Institute of Physics have conferences that might be annual, biannual, or irregular. So a, a scientist will stand in front of an audience and present his research findings. But a conference proceedings is a permanent record of what went on there. OK, so here's an example of some conference proceedings in physics. Critical problems in physics held at Princeton in 1996. OK, and so on. So those are examples of conferences which are books in the library which have original research. A review journal is a condensed version of a research journal. It summarizes research done over a short period of time. It will omit the detailed experimental procedures. So like reviews of modern physics, reviews of mathematical physics are two examples of review journals. Okay, a magazine. A magazine is also issued periodically, but unlike a journal, the articles are much more general and it's written in a language that's suitable for a more general audience. Many articles in magazines are written by journals, journalists, rather than by scientists who have done the research. So like Physics Today is an example. Okay, it might be written so a physicist in one specialty can understand articles in another specialty. Scientific American is for the lay public. It will include many physical physics articles. Okay, a monograph is kind of like a fancy um, uh, name for a book. Okay, that's only published once. Books are obviously written at uh, levels ranging from elementary school to graduate school. Okay, so it represents research done over a longer period of time. Okay, so it really makes the information that maybe a few years earlier were, were done in um, uh, journals are now written in books, so it's available to a wider audience. Okay, a handbook, which can be in print or electronic, is a summary of the highlights of the topic written more as a review than as an instructional work. Okay, so here are some examples of handbooks. Um, CRC Handbook of Chemistry and Physics, the Handbook of Physics, Handbook of Nanoscience Engineering Technology, and Novel, which is an electronic handbook, which is actually uh, an aggregation of about 800 handbooks. So I have in my next slide a little description of Novel. So Novel is a searchable database of handbooks, data sets, reference sources in science, technology, and, and engineering. Uh, the version of novel we have here at, at NGIT is really suited more for chemists, but it does have enough um, physics information um, uh, in it. Okay. So, so again, the novel, as I said a minute ago, was an aggregation of over 800 
handbooks. So here is a, a listing of some of the handbooks that are available within Novel. Okay, an encyclopedia is very general. It introduces readers uh, to uh, specialized fields. So maybe back in school, high school, you use something like the Encyclopedia Britannica. But there are encyclopedias for physicists as well. McGraw-Hill Concise Encyclopedia of Physics, uh, Encyclopedia of Applied Physics, and so on. Okay, they're in print format here at the NGIT Library. They introduce readers to a field. Oops, okay, let me go back to that. All right, okay. Now, this is a Wikipedia. Yeah, the Wikipedias might be around for about 12, 15 years by now, but can it be trusted as a source of science and engineering um, information? Uh, as you know, the Wikipedia, anybody can write an article and somebody else can change it and you don't know who is the author. The author could be a high school student for all you know. Uh, it can be useful. There are times when you can use it and other times when you shouldn't. So again, it, it can be good for obtaining background information on a topic. The articles can be revised and edited uh, quickly. Uh, some articles in the Wikipedia are better than others. I think nowadays the Wikipedia has a staff of volunteers who can uh, edit it. It's, I think it's more reliable than it was when it, it first started uh, 12 or so years ago. But again, remember, it does not go into the peer review process. So I think it's okay to consult with it, but don't use it in your bibliography. Okay, there's a flow of scientific information from somebody who creating it to somebody who uses it. So the scientist and engineer who creates articles, puts it in journal artic journals or conference proceedings, and then it eventually goes down to books. And then there's the tertiary literature, handbooks, encyclopedias, or textbooks. So students like yourself, when you're starting your research, should look at the tertiary literature, handbooks, encyclopedias, and textbooks. But then as you need more specific information is to go into journal articles. And to get at journal articles, you use what we used to call indexes and abstracts, but now we call them uh, databases. And I think most of the rest of this presentation will be devoted to the databases that you can use in physics. Okay, so again, I'm, I represent it here. You can read this slide um, if you like. I'll, I'll leave it up for a few seconds. So if you like, uh, you can read it. And there's also a non-narrated version of this presentation as well on the physics research guide. Okay, so there are types of databases. There's the bibliographic database, which includes the elements needed to identify the document, the author, the title, the name of the journal, the year, the volume, the issue number, and pages. But most of the bibliographic databases will include the abstract, which is that short summary. So I showed you in that journal article we looked at that journal articles have abstracts at the beginning. So likewise when you do a database search and you get an answer set, uh, it will include the abstract which is a one paragraph summary which will help you decide is the article of interest to you. And then we have full text databases which will include the entire article in electronic uh, format. Okay, and then there are numeric data compilations such as the novel database which I discussed a few minutes ago. 
the limitation to database. No database covers every subject. Number of publications, so no database can be exhaustive. The dates, usually the newer the data publication, the more likely it's available electronically. And the types of publications, okay, there are some databases that are limited only to patents, for example. Okay, and not all databases provide the full text or links to the full text. Okay, so again, back in the old days when I was a student, uh, everything was available in print. It was very cumbersome and difficult to use as we moved on the years, went to the 1970s, the online era. You paid as you went. The cost was based on the amount of information retrieved. Those days are gone. Maybe in the 1980s, we used CD-ROMs. But as we got into the 1990s, we got into the World Wide Web era, which goes on today. But back in the 1990s, the computers were not as fast as they were today. So that World Wide Web allows for uh, remote access. Okay, so the databases for physics. Again, physics, of course, is very multidisciplinary. Scopus covers all the STEM disciplines, science, technology, engineering, medicine, and certainly physics is within Scopus. Um, SciFinder is a chemistry-related database, but you can't draw the line. This is chemistry, this is physics. Uh, a lot of physics information is in SciFinder. SciFinder has a disadvantage that you have to open up a, an account at NGIT to use it. Maybe it only takes five minutes or so. IEEE is the Institute for Electrical and Electronics Engineers. Okay, it does cover some physics. There's a lot of electrical engineering information. It's really more, more physics. So you might have to search more than one database to find the information that you need. Okay, so here are some single publisher databases. Usually the single publisher databases are full text. The databases that I discussed before, these are bibliographic databases. IEEE does cover full text, but Scopus and SciFinder do not. But these databases here, American Institute of Physics, uh, Institute of Physics, Springer Link, are publisher specific and they will include the full text of the articles. So you can do a search in Scopus or SciFinder and you'll find an article and it will give you a link to the one of these full text artic, uh, databases that has the specific article that you need. Scopus. Scopus is a multidisciplinary bibliographic database that has records back to the 60s. Okay, and it will link to the full text articles. I think when I finish the PowerPoint, I will go through one example and will uh, do a sample search in Scopus. Okay, SciFinder. Okay, I do discuss this more in depth when I... Uh, lecture to chemistry and chemical engineering students. Uh, it's an electronic version of chemical abstracts back to 1907. And it does cover many physics journals. But the articles in SciFinder might have, might have uh, some chemistry content. Okay, and it contains links to full text articles. And you can search by chemical substance, reaction, research topic, author, or affiliation. Accessible from a website, and I said you must register to use it. Okay, so going back to some of the full text um, databases. Okay, American Institute of Physics, of course, is a professional society. So Applied Physics Letters, Journal of uh, Applied Physics, are examples of a few journals that they publish. 
the Institute of Physics, IOP. So I have a list here of a few journals that they publish. IEEE. Okay, some aspects of electrical engineering are not related to physics, but I think some of these are. IEEE transactions on applied superconductivity. As I mentioned before, you can't draw the line at disciplines. Physical Review Online, okay, used to be just, it was one journal called Physical Review, but some years back they split it up, A, B, C, D, and E. Physical Review B is condensed matter, Physical Review C, nuclear physics, and so on. So journals by their nature are very specific. Springer Link, okay, Springer is a for-profit publisher and here's an example of three journals that they publish. Science Direct published by Elsevier. Elsevier also publishes Scopus. So Elsevier is the world's largest publisher of STEM publications. Um, again, of course it covers physics and those are examples of a few Elsevier journals in Science Direct that are related to physics. Wiley is another for-profit organization in the publishing business and those are an example of a few journals that they publish. Okay, we have something when I get finished with this PowerPoint we'll go on to the NGIT library home page and um, search all aggregates several NGIT databases. It does not include SciFinder, but kind of a nice advantage of that is that you can limit by peer review or limit by full text availability at NGIT. Availability of journals. Okay, we probably don't get any in print anymore. Electronic, yep, that's what we're getting. But sometimes there's a, a, a line, a date, before a certain date, the journal is available in print. After a certain date, it's available only electronic. And there's a journal tab on the library homepage where you can uh, search on for journals. Open access journals, well, I'll just mention it briefly, is that um, they are available to everybody on the web. But the person who writes the article after the article is accepted, after it undergoes the rigorous peer review process, pays for it. For the other journals that I discussed, uh, they're subscription based. We at NGIT pay so many dollars a year for a certain journal and we have access to it. But open access journals are available to everybody. Okay, we have an interlibrary loan service. Any time that you need a book or a journal that we don't have here at the NGIT library, you can order it through interlibrary loan. Okay, you need to develop search strategies using Boolean logic. The AND operator limits the search. High temperature superconductors and thin films. The OR expands it, single wall or multi wall carbon nanotubes. The NOT limits it, superconductors, not yttrium. Devising optimal um, search strategies. Choose the proper databases. You may have to use more than one if you need to be exhaustive. Know their scope and limitations. Use all relevant search terms and think of the appropriate Boolean logic. Think of concepts, not words. And if you need to be precise, okay, you only need a few references. You might get get away with using the literal terminology, but if you need to be exhaustive, then you need to use more terms using the OR operator, and you may have to cut down if too many citations are retrieved. 
Is your answer reasonable? Or you do a search, you get an answer set. Unfortunately, it only takes a few seconds to get an answer set. And take a quick look of what you've retrieved. If it's not what you're looking for, what can you do differently? And keep in mind the thought processes in applying the scientific method to laboratory experiments apply in the search for technical information. Ask for help. We have a reference desk and here's our phone number. I'll leave it on for a couple of seconds and you can get us through a chat as well. Okay, evaluating websites. Um, I know uh, there's always that Google mentality. Students love to um, search uh, Google and get results. Uh, let me just give you a quick look at this um, website here, how to evaluate websites. Okay, so you need to look at the authority, the accuracy of the website, audience, you know, and so on. So be careful when you, if you do a Google search at the websites that you retrieve, that make sure that they're, they're quality and who wrote them. Do you know a journal article is written by a professional who's an expert in the field, but some websites are, are commercial and uh, they may not give you really what you need. Okay, cite your sources appropriately. Um, there's the various style guides that you can look at. Uh, if you ever took the research roadmaps here at NGIT, those are discussed there. And the databases can output your bibliography in the format of choice. Software provided by NGIT. Um, if you go to I, this website here, ist.njit.edu slash software az.php, there's uh, many softwares that you can download that NGIT supports. Uh, there's some bibliographic man, uh, management software. There's EndNote, which is supported by NGIT. You can download it. But there's also Mendeley and Zotero, which are free. Interlibrary loan, I, me I mentioned that briefly before. You can order a book or an article that we don't have here at the NJIT library. But please be complete when submitting a request for an article or book. Okay, there's also, I'll mention this, uh, this is important for graduate students, citing references. When you look at a paper, let's say a 1998 paper, you look at the references and it will have older references in there. When you're doing a cited reference search, you see it's a measure of the importance of that paper. So like a paper in 1998 will be cited years later. And the more citations a paper has is means how important it is, how it was accepted by the other specialists in the field years later. Okay, we can find that in Scopus or SciFinder. Okay, we have that research guide here. Research guides at ngit.edu slash physics. So you can also look at the non-narrated version of this presentation and click on some of the links. Okay, so let's do a some. I have a number of uh, sample searches here. So there's three on this slide. Maybe we'll try the um, one here. Properties of of graphene nano ribbons, and we'll do that in both SciFinder, Scopus, and the Search All. Okay, I have a few more sample searches here. You know, it's up to you if you want to do it. So again, this concludes our PowerPoint here. Okay, my name is uh, Bruce Slutsky. Here's my email and my phone number. If I can be of assistance to you at any time in the future, please uh, feel free um, to uh, contact me. Okay, so this concludes the PowerPoint, but what we'll do now, we'll go to the NGIT library homepage. So this is the front door to the library. 
that you can access the resources through the um, NGIT library homepage. So if you're looking for a specific journal, you can search here. Um, let's say for argument's sake, a physical review E. Search here. Uh, something went wrong here. Let's just be physical review. And here's E over here. Must have made his typo. And if you want physical review E, click on here and it tells you where to go. So for some of the older years, we have it in print, but you can click here to get the electronic version of physical review E. Okay. All right. Oh, I spelt it wrong. You see, that's the obvious. That's why I missed it. Okay. All right. Interlibrary loan here. Just follow, log into Iliad and just follow the instructions. So let's go to databases. Let's look at Scopus. Okay, so what I'm going to do here is properties of graphene nanoribbons. So here it can do a Boolean AND. Um, graphene nanoribbons and properties. Okay, search. It does a Boolean search on that. There are 2201 hits. Okay, it's sorted on date here. Okay, so the most recent ones will come up first, 2017 publication dates. But you can search on, uh, sort on um, relevance. Okay, so here's one here. Graphene nano ribbons, fabrication, properties, and devices. And it tells you Journal of Physics D. Okay, so again, click here. You will get the abstract. The abstract gives you more information. If you want to uh, see the full text of this article, you would publish or check for full text. Okay, again, article PDF, and you got it here. Here's the full text of the article. It's an IOP science, and you see how detailed that is. Okay, let's try this search again in SciFinder. Okay, we'll close this. Don't need this. Okay, close these. Okay. Admittedly, this is very fast, so you really need to take some time to go through this. Now, with SciFinder, okay, it'll prompt you here to um, use your, uh, to register. So, the registration process is very quick. Um, it will eventually ask you for some information here, and you fill it out. You make up a username and password. It'll send a link to your NGIT email. And then um, you'll have the account for as long as you're a student here at NGIT. So let's go back here. Uh, SciFinder again. And we'll go I'll use my account. OK, there you go. I'm going to log in. And it knows you like Google, so the search box is very much like Google. Okay, there you go. So I'm going to see here. Okay, properties of graphene nano ribbons. Um, Okay, so again, if you want a high precision search, 2991 references were found containing properties of gra graphene nanoribbons is entered. If you would want a more exhaustive search, 2445 references were found containing the two concepts, properties and graphene nanoribbons closely associated with, the, with each other. Let's try the high precision search.
Okay, so what you can do here, let's refine, let's refine language. Let's try just English. Okay, so let's say you have here, you like number six, revealing the electronic structure of silicon intercalated armchair graphene nanoribbons by scanning tunneling spectroscopy. Click here. Okay, gives you the abstract. Okay, you like the article, link to other sources, retrieves the full text. Okay, so here's a link to the article, and here's the PDF, and there you go. Okay, the article there in full text. Okay, let's try it in the uh, search all, and um, then I'll conclude this presentation. Okay, so I'm going to log off SciFinder, sign out, yes. Okay, go back to the library home page. Okay, I'm going to search all, advanced search. I'm going to say here, you can the pull down menu here if you want. Okay, properties. Graphene nano ribbons. Oops, spelt it wrong, you see? Nano ribbons. Okay. Uh, no, extra R. All right. Okay. Search. What I can do here, I can say limit to, to full text. So this way I know the NGIT library has it. If I did the search in Scopus or SciFinder, I may hit an article that we don't have here in NGIT. Full text. Here you go. Ab initio study of the electronic and transport properties of waved graphene nanoribbons. Okay. View record in Scopus. So it's leading me to Scopus again. Check for full text. There you go. Download PDF. Article. Okay. All right. Okay. So again, I hope you will f follow up on what I've covered in this presentation. Okay. I thank you very much for your kind attention, and I hope you'll see me or one of the other librarians, and we'll be very happy to help you out if you need assistance in finding resources from the NGIT library. Okay, thank you very much, and have a nice day.